Thank you for joining this incredible live stream event. We will be starting in five minutes. In the meantime, while you wait, please check out our store table located in the foyer of Revived Church or in our online store at olivetreeviews.org. Hi, Jan Markell here, Olive Tree Ministries. Enthused about recommending Ken Michael, one of our representatives, to speak at your church or group. He has 30 years in law enforcement, and that includes criminal investigations and security consulting. And his seminar, Understanding Our Times, will truly help you do just that. So I highly recommend him to your church or group. Thanks a lot for considering. Well, hey, everyone, Ken Michael here from Olive Tree Ministries. You know, if you've been listening to Jan's radio program or watching the program online, you know there is a lot happening in this country and around the world. And we're hearing from people that they're having difficulty discerning the truth from what they're hearing in our media, our social media, from friends, from family. And we here at Olive Tree Ministries are committed to getting the truth out there about the changes that are going on in this world because we're committed to getting the gospel out there. We look deep into the Bible and what does God have to say about this? So if you'd like me to come and speak to your church or group, contact me at ken at olivetreeviews.org. That's Ken at olivetreeviews.org. I'll come out. We'll discuss everything that's going on. And it's always a great time when remnant believers get together and get a chance to talk and really hash out some of the things that are going on in this world. And most importantly, we need to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out there right now. So contact me today. I look forward to seeing all of you very soon. Thank you, and God bless you all.
Get ready. That's right, friends. And if you're... If you haven't trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not ready. And tonight, we're going to give you a chance to get ready to trust in Jesus Christ as we go through the program tonight. But especially at the end, I want to have a special invitation for you. You just ask God to touch your heart. You ask God to touch your soul as we're talking tonight. And then tonight, before it's done, I want to invite you to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, to get ready, because Jesus is coming. Well, hey, welcome, friends, to Understanding the Times. My name is Mark Henry. Let's welcome Jan Markell. Thank you for coming. Online, thank you. Online, you don't know. We got a Minnesota storm, and we got lots of people here, so they are hearty Minnesotans. Thank you. And, you know, I was, yeah, give yourself a hand. And I'm listening to some secular talk show hosts, and they all say variations of what insane times we live in. I don't, I don't understand what's going on. Why is everything so out of, out of joint, crazy? Well, they don't understand the Bible. That's why they can't make sense of anything. And what did you expect the last days to look like? That's my new mantra. What did you expect it to look like? Probably a lot like it is today. So we'll talk about that tonight. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, we're going to talk about that tonight. But let me just uh, say thank you for all of you who are joining online right now. I know there are watch groups, families opening up their homes, inviting people. We've got a watch group right now in western Colorado. I want to say thank you to them for joining us tonight. People from other parts of the world. In fact, all over the English-speaking world, people are joining us tonight. And we want you to know that we get... Jan and I get emails every single week from all of you. We hear the, the burdens of your heart. We hear the, the struggles that you're going through. Recently, I, this, well, just this week, I had someone reach out to me and say, Mark, I was listening to you and Jan, and I know I'm not going to heaven. Would you please help me figure out whether or not I have eternal life if I'm going in the rapture, if I'm going to have eternal life? And that happens all around the world. We just want you to know that we're excited tonight because Jesus is going to touch hearts and lives literally all around the world. Now, uh, this, this, this morning, Jan and I met earlier, and then we, at lunchtime we had a prayer meeting. We want you to know we're praying for you. We love you. We love you that are online watching right now. And our prayer tonight is this for each of you, that after we get done, that your, your hand will be strengthened. Listen to Psalm 31, verse 24. It says, be strong and let your heart take courage, all of you who hope in the Lord. And that's going to be thematic through tonight because information in and of itself doesn't give us strength, hope, and clarity. But when you trust in the Lord, there's this grace that comes to us. And as it says in the New Testament, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. So we want to strengthen your hand tonight. Now we're going to do three things. We're going to introduce our speaker tonight, Tom Hughes. And your heart's going to be blessed as he shares with us. Then we're going to have a panel discussion. And any time while that's going on, when Tom is speaking or during the panel discussion, there's going to be a phone number here behind me up on the screens. And you can text your questions, all right? And so we want you to engage with us. We're going to have that Q&A at the end. So those are the three things Tom's going to share, panel discussion and the Q&A. We want to answer the pressing questions that you have, uh, that you feel in your heart so that we can be a blessing to you. Well, let's, let's just unite in prayer. Wherever you're at, just bow your head if you're uh, joining us online. Just bow your head right where you're at. Father, we are thankful that you're the God of heaven and earth. And we trust in you tonight. And God, I ask that for all of my friends, you'd strengthen their hand in Jesus' name, amen. Well, tonight, many of you know our speaker, uh, Tom Hughes, is the founder of Hope for Our Times. He's a lead pastor of 412 Church in San Jacinto, California. Uh, he's been teaching Bible prophecy for about 30 years, and he has a unique gift of helping people understand well, what the Bible calls the last days, and I know he's going to be a blessing to you. Tom shares weekly on a prophecy update at uh, Hope for Our Times on his website and his YouTube channel. He regularly appears in a variety of TV, radio, and internet programs, including World News Briefing on his channel. 
And I want you to know this. Tom is a personal friend of mine. We date back about 15 years. Sometimes, you know, with speakers, you wonder about them. Are they really genuine? Are they really followers of Jesus? I can tell you, I know Tom, and I know his wife, and I know his church, and his family. These are great followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's welcome Tom Hughes. Wow. So... Oops, this isn't on. No. Yes. I can hear that. So, I, Mark, I, I, you know, you talked about us being friends. I want to say something real quick because I'm not so sure about this. <laughs> so it's 85 degrees back home, and I found out today you invited Brandon Holthouse in April. <laughs> Look at me, Mark. <laughs> Lord, we thank you for this great opportunity. We ask for your glory. Uh, may you be blessed, and I pray for your ministering to everyone here and everybody watching online in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, this is great being here. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to uh, not go into a lot of introductions, but I am not used to cold weather. And so I hope that Mark understands how much I love him just for showing up. But, uh, but this really is a huge blessing to see this many people here on a Thursday evening when it's, there, there's like ice out there. Did you guys know there's ice out there? Where I come from, there is no ice except in your freezer, and that's it. And if it's raining, or the possibility of rain. If the, your weather app says it might rain, people don't go anywhere. They, they, they don't know, they, they, they just don't. They don't know how to drive, they don't do anything. And that's the truth. <laughs> this is great being here. So I'm gonna discuss 10 signs that Jesus is coming. Uh, let's get going with this. But first of all, I wanna bring you to, I guess you would say, let me take you through a few pictures that really help explain where we are right now. Um, here's this first one. Aliens probably ride past Earth and lock their doors. I said to myself, that, that I, yeah, yeah. You know. Although I do have different thoughts on current alien sightings. Uh, we'll get there in a, in a few minutes. But I thought that was rather humorous. Uh, this next one is not so humorous because this shows why aliens would ride past Earth and lock their doors. This is actually sickening. Litter boxes in school bathrooms for kids who identify as cats. So when you see, I, I mean, this is the nutty stuff we're hearing. And you think how we've been given over. If, we, if I have enough time, I'll mention that in a few minutes, but... Uh, I look at this, how, how could you, if this is what people actually think, this type of thing. But then there's this, when I hear someone start a sentence with, when things go back to normal. <laughs> I, 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 my feeling is, we're, we're not ever going to go back to what it was in 2019, and people uh, don't like to hear that, but I think we need to face the reality of where we are. Uh, I love, Jan, what you said your, your new phrase, um, what did you expect it to look like? That's a great message for a, ti a, a title for a message. But I mean, really, when we look at it, and we're not going to go back, so what, what are things going to look like in the very near future, and what do they look like right now? Uh, so we're going to go there, but I just want to make sure that we do this all of us make sure of this. It fits well with the introduction that we had with the video we had and with what Pastor Mark said. It is this, the Lord Jesus is coming perhaps today and are you ready? And, and man, uh, we need to be ready. So let's get going. We have the first sign of the 10 signs that Jesus is coming soon. Uh, number one, lawlessness will abound. So, I'm going to read this to you. This is, some of you saw this. I have to have my phone because apparently I messed up on my slides. You ready for this? Yeah. Homelessness in the San Francisco Bay Area is now so bad 
Their residents are being asked to house a homeless person in their own homes. Did anybody hear about that one? Just, I, I mean, seriously. It is that bad. I know the valley I live in. It is, it's, it's bad. Politicians and charities claim locals want to be part of the solution. Well, yeah, I want to be part of the solution, but I'm not going to invite people into my home like that. And I can see the direction this is already going to go because we already hear, hear well, if you loved your neighbor, the, if you're really a Christian, then this is what you would do, right? So we hear this type of thing. We have the whole defund police movement, which I think began somewhere in this area. <laughs> Jesus did say in Matthew chapter 24 that lawlessness will abound. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. So we see lawlessness abounding. Uh, we have in Los Angeles, it was just voted on yesterday. It is, oh, all these pictures in here of snow I have. <laughs> what do we have? Oh, I have it right here. What am I thinking? There it is. It is, oh. I, am, I got this really bad habit. Please forgive me, Amanda. I have my laptop, and I'm used to my clicker, and now I got another clicker. So I got to back this thing. Oh, there it is. Okay, now we're matching. <laughs> Board of Supervisors vote to terminate approximately 4,000 L.A. sheriffs. This article goes on and says... The Board of Supervisors vote, vote to terminate approximately 4,000 LASD personnel during a time when murders have increased over 94% and there is a hiring freeze in the department. Today, the Board of Supervisors followed through on their threat and voted 4 to 0 with one abstention to form a suicide pact and start the process to fire 4,000 deputies for not getting the, you know, the, the snake bite thing that you're not allowed to mention. 4,000 deputies, what will that do to Los Angeles? What will it, well, Los Angeles already have, has enough problems. What's it gonna do to the area I live? Uh, I mean, you already see what's happened uh, just from here. And then you start looking at this movement. This is lawlessness. So in the last days, this is very interesting how Lindsay recently pointed it out that the Bible shows a picture, gives us a picture of the last days with lawlessness abounding, but at the same time we have this, this uh, very strong rule that comes from Antichrist with iron teeth as has Daniel described it. So how do you have this super strong rule with at the same time, you, when at the same time you have lawlessness? It's like this. The lawlessness, I believe, is being purposely created bring in the chaos, and then the people cry out, we need something to save us, give us anybody you can, and the right police to be able to control all of the chaos and all of the lawlessness that there is. Jesus says this is how it's going to be in the last days, and we see how all of it is developing. I personally believe with police leaving the police force and so forth that what is happening is it's intentional with the intention to bring in federalized police, bring in the brown shirts. But the most lawless place that we have is in the womb. So when Jesus says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, I, I, I believe the most lawless place is in the womb. And here's a very short video that really helps us to see just the condition that our world is in. I promise I would kill my baby if I get pregnant. So this is point number one. Lawlessness will abound. Uh, point number two, we have the apostate, oops, apostate church. So I'm going to read this to you. 
from Jeremiah chapter 23. I was going to read it in King James, and this is going to be a little bit easier for you to understand. All right? God is calling out the priests and the prophets in the area of Judah as he's warning them Babylon is about ready to come and destroy you. And he says, you are as wicked as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's saying to the prophets. He says, therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will feed them with bitterness and give them poison to drink. For it is because of Jerusalem's prophets that wickedness fills this land. In other words, it's because they were not being faithful to proclaiming the word of God, the wickedness has filled the land. He's putting the blame for the problems in the culture on the prophets. Today, I would agree when I look at our world, I would put the blame in the pulpit. The, the pastor's not preaching the truth of God's word. And then he goes on and says, for it's because Jerusalem's prophets, wickedness fills the land. This is my warning to my people, says the Lord Almighty. Do not listen to these false prophets when they prophesy to you, listen to this, filling you with futile hopes they are making up everything they say. They do not speak for the Lord. They keep saying to these rebels who despise my word, they keep saying to the people who don't want to hear the truth, don't worry, the Lord says you will have peace. No harm will come your way. Just follow what we tell you. And, and Jeremiah is warning, no, here's the truth Judgment is coming. I look at this, and then I think of what's going on today. Check out this next article. I'm going to go through these quickly. Texas churches, abortion, a moral and social good. That's from September. The Gospel Coalition argues for vaccine passports to attend church. Uh, listen, Nowhere in the Bible do you have any kind of condition when you are saying you cannot come to church. You deal with sin. You deal with the sin problem. A person comes to church that's a sinner. You don't say, hey, you're not welcome here unless you got a passport. A person that's a believer, you don't say you're not welcome here unless you have a passport. So the person who does not know Christ wants to come to church, a place where they can hear about Christ, is told, well, you're not allowed to come in unless you have this piece of paper with you. There's this no room at the inn for the unvaccinated. Archbishop of Canterbury says unvaccinated are immoral in jab boost. And then there's this I find most interesting how the federal government used evangelical leaders to spread COVID um, information. I'm not allowed to say that in the same thing. To churches. So some of you may have heard this if you're listening to JD last week. Uh, and, and I had it on my uh, update, a little bit of it. More of it I'm going to do this Sunday night. But I can't read all of this article because of sensitivity issues. But I will say this, this article goes on to say uh, how Ed uh, Stetzer, uh, Wheaton College Dean, was interviewed by Francis Collins of the National Institute of Health. And along with Ed Stetzer, we also have in this document, or this article, this was on the Daily Mail. It was Ed Stetzer, Christian, Christianity Today, the Gospel Coalition, which I just showed you that other copy of, Russell Moore, which is no surprise there, Tim Keller, Rick Warren, just to name those. So Rick Warren, he spoke a while back at the World Economic Forum, so he's, he's tied in with this group. Did you guys know that? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So... Rick Warren is talking with Francis Collins, and he says this. This is a quote. 
wearing a mask is the great commandment. Because it falls in with love your neighbor, right? And then he says this, another quote from Rick Warren. Let me just say a word to the priests and pastors and rabbis and other faith leaders. This is our job to deal with these conspiracy issues and things like that. This is our job as pastors to deal with people like us. One of the responsibilities of faith leaders is to tell people, get this, to trust the science. I have never been told uh, when I became a pastor, hey, uh, you got to tell everybody to trust the science. Okay. So Jeremiah chapter 23. Don't listen to these people. They are liars. They're false prophets. They're telling you to just go along with the system and everything's going to be okay. You're going to have peace. Do not worry about judgment coming. I'm very concerned. I believe judgment is coming. And I'm at this place in my life where I believe it is my duty to warn people of what I see. When, when uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was alive during Nazi Germany, regardless of your thoughts on Dietrich Bonhoeffer, just think of this. He was part of the resistance movement. At, I think it was at the peak of the resistance movement, there were 7,000 pastors that were part of the resistance movement to Hitler. That might sound like a lot, but there were 40,000 that just went along with. Well, just, just go along with it. It's going to be okay. Uh, Hitler's just doing this thing. We're going to get through this. And 40,000 that were complicit in the killing of the Jews because they just went along with the system. Number three, economic catastrophe. John D. Rockefeller said, we will always hide the divine truth from them that we are all one. That he must never know. They must never know that color is an illusion. They must always believe that they are not equal. Drop by drop, drop by drop, we will advance our goal. We will take over their lands, resources, and wealth to exercise control over them. We will trick them into accepting laws that will steal the little freedom they have. We will set up a money system that will shut them down forever, keeping them and their children in debt. So this isn't rocket science, but we are all watching uh, economic challenges. I do not live far from the supply chain issue with the boats in Long Beach, California and Los Angeles, uh, probably about an hour and a half, maybe two hours away. Uh, many friends that live in that area, it's a real issue. We, I hear about the farming problem, the fertilizer problem, uh, the printing of trillions of dollars. I watch a whole lot of financial markets and news. Uh, in fact, one of my joys at night is to watch financial news and just and watching things collapse. But I believe it fits in well with Revelation chapter 6 with the rider on the black horse. A collapsed economy, if you listen to the globalists, is necessary to bring about their crypto economy. And I don't believe it's going to be cryptocurrency in the exact forms we have now, like Bitcoin and so forth, uh, because Bitcoin is decentralized. Governments can't control it, but what's coming, coming is going to be centralized so the governments can control what's coming. It's all part of, the, all, all part of this mess. Uh, number four is the end of America as we know it. I'm going to show you a video. This is the longest part of my presentation. The video is about five minutes long. Uh, the person speaking, his name is Yuri Beznov. He was a KGB member, a Soviet defector. This interview is from 1985. In it, he's going to talk about four things. He's going to say, first of all, uh, what the uh, communists know you need to do is demoralize the people. Then you need to um, uh, I can't remember. What, what is it? Demoralize, then you need to destabilize. Then you need to create a crisis. And then you need to normalize. Now he explains it all here. 
But I want you to pay special attention to this. He's going to talk about how once a people are demoralized, they will not believe the facts. They will reject the truth. So pay attention to this. It is five minutes long, but I think you're going to find it rather informative. Or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's over fulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flab, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense, an economy. Uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis to promise people all kind of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with the benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will go to Moscow to kiss the bottoms of, of new generation of Soviet assassins. Never mind. He will create false illusions that 
the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. The United States is in a state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. So I look at that, that's from 1985, and the things he laid out, how, you, how the communists do that, and what he said. And you wonder why people don't receive facts. Well, they've been educated. He said it takes 15 to 20 years to demoralize. That started in the 1960s, so you can see how many generations have been affected. It explains a whole lot. And he says, we are at war. 1985. Mondale. It just, yeah, Walter Mondale, for those of you who are old enough to remember Walter Mondale. I mean, look at this. So the end of America, why do I say the end of America as we know it? Um, because I don't believe America is a superpower in the last days. And I can support that biblically. I'm not going to get into all of that right now for time's uh, sake. But the truth is a, a global system that the Bible describes could never come about if America was a superpower. And Satan knows you have to bind the strong man in order to rob the whole house. Well, guess what? You, America has to be bound in order to bring about this global empire, and we are watching it. Uh, next up, number five, is people groups, when citizens would be divided uh, into good citizens and bad citizens. And it's really easy to support, because Jesus said one of the signs of his second coming is nation would be against nation. It would increase with frequency, like birth pains upon a pregnant woman. Uh, Jesus used the phrase, the beginning of sorrows, which is... Uh, a reference to birth pains, but nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Well, the word nation, the English word, uh, comes from a Greek word, uh, ethnos. We get our English word ethnic from that, and it means people group. And we are watching people group being divided against people group, just as, we're, as we observe everything that's going on right now. We can see what's taking place with people group against people group. Watch what's happening in Canada. You watch what's happening in our own cities, in our own counties. You watch what you guys think about Californians, right? I was just in Florida. I know what people think about Californians. And I try to explain, I'm not like one of them. Oh, yeah, sure you're not. <laughs> but it's happening. People have been conditioned to uh, do many different things. Uh, make sure that you have an identification and when, you, when you go out, you're uh, rat on people, um, that kind of thing. You're willing to turn in your neighbor. You're willing to turn in your coworker. You're willing to go on mass media and say how bad these other people are. People are conditioned for what is coming during the tribulation period. Let me move on to the next thing. Uh, number six, we have, oops, let me get here. Here we go. Let's go here. Number six is earth worship. Uh, I believe that is something that is very evident that takes place in the last days. Uh, Paul wrote in Romans chapter one, as he speaks about giving the people over to a reprobate mind, he also says in there that the people worship the creation rather than the creator. And what's happening right now, the whole planet is being lifted up and the sky and everything involved is being lifted up as if it's our God. Uh, we need to take care of Mother Earth. We need to, uh, we got, uh, uh, you guys are destroying everything. Uh, you're not allowed to eat meat anymore. By the way, I want to say the best steak I ever had in my life was last night in Minnesota. You guys got really good food. <laughs> and, I mean, it's like really good. It's like outrageously good. But, uh, but this is from a uh, uh, a book that I wrote a while back. And from this is a quote from Pope Francis in 2015. This is what he said in his encyclical. International negotiations cannot make significant progress due to positions taken by countries which place their national interest above the global common good. 
He was talking about climate change. That's what he's talking about. The national interest. Hence, you can't have a superpower. You've got to be, it's global. Uh, he said, there's urgent need for a true world political authority, one authoritative source and oversight and coordination, which lays down the rules for the global common good. He said, he called for a global, a global, excuse me, governmental entity that can override nations acting in their own interests. He said to, he wants to make the power global and coalesce that power into the hands of a few. I mean, you, you look at this and you go, this sounds very biblical. Not that he's being right biblical, but that he's on the wrong side. Uh, and Agenda 2030, I'm going to move on to the next point. Agenda 2030 says this, item number 10 of Agenda 2030, reduce inequality within and among countries, a.k.a. wealth uh, redistribution, but it's all about global, it, it really comes from the climate problem. Um, and, and then the con uh, countries like the United States, it's reduce us to third level status, not lift up third level to United States status. It's crash everything, collapse everything, all under the guise of climate and taking care of each other and making sure everybody's equal because when you have too much stuff as an American, that's very bad. And you're destroying everything, making it bad for people that are in Mexico, bad for people that are in Africa. Mark, I got a... a I can go through this in about five minutes, or you want me to just quit now? You're good? You sure? Because I heard Billy Crone got to go an hour and a half. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> I won't do that. I won't do that to you, maybe. Let's, I'll move on. Let me, let me go through this. I'll go through these real quick. I'll just get past this. Let me go to number seven. We have globalism, all right? Um, this is another short video I'm going to show you. Uh, people have said this is a fake video. I seem to recall this actually happening with Walter Cronkite. So how many of you are old enough to remember Walter Cronkite? Well, this is a, okay, you're gonna, you're, okay, good. That makes it easy then. For those of you who don't know Walter Cronkite, you're gonna be introduced to him right now. Their leader, Pat Robertson, has written in a book a few years ago that we should have a world government, but only when the Messiah arrives. <laughs> he wrote, and literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I'm, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. <laughs> Let us hear the peal of a new international liberty bell that calls us all to the creation of a system of enforceable world law in which the universal desire for peace can place its hope and its prayers. Thank you. We would like to bring you a message from the First Lady of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> So I, I spared you, I was full of grace, I spared you, Hillary, so you should thank me for that. But I sat through her speech like five times, thank you. And uh, it was just gushing on Walter and the world order and all of these things. But real quickly, what do you need to bring about this global, uh, this global system? We need an economy that's tracking globally. You need the whole political system to work, to oversee this whole thing. You need this global religious system, which is a reason that apostasy works so well because you have the apostate church that just gives right into the work of this global religious system. It all works together. So everything that we know that's good and right needs to be crashed. And then you have a, 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 a to make this work, you also need a military that changes. I'll make this as quick as I can, but a couple of real brief examples. My son is 20 years old. He graduated from high school a couple years back. A lot of his friends went into the military. Uh, one went to West Point, and she was brilliant. She left West Point uh, because she was able to leave West Point without getting in trouble. 
And she left West Point. She said, it is just unbelievably woke. And then we ha he has another friend, very conservative, when he went into the military. He just came back for a visit a couple weeks ago, full on as woke as you can get. And I mean, the things he was talking about, totally opposite of the way he went in. But what's going to be necessary for this global system, military, the global system, police force, and so forth? Uh, uh, one more quick story is our, um, uh, we have another one of our kids' friends, hangs out our house a lot. He's a senior in high school. He, he spearheaded a uh, don't wear your mask today thing at school. It was last Thursday or Wednesday. I can't remember what day it was or Friday. And uh, any of the kids or one kid in specific wasn't wearing his mask. He got jumped, bullied, got his head smashed into the concrete, got hauled off on a stretcher and, and in an ambulance because he wasn't wearing a mask. So when you start to look at the things that the Nazis did, did you know that less than 10% of the Germans uh, were, would be considered part of the Nazi party? How did they get the other 90% to go along? Or the ones who weren't part of the resistance? They just didn't want to stir the pot, they didn't want to get involved, but they were willing to sit by while other, while other people were being bullied where other people were being hauled off and all of these things. But I mean, you look at this now, what happens? You, you beat up the kid that doesn't go along with it. So we have a generation of high schoolers, junior hires, younger, young men and women in the military that are being prepped for this global system. Number eight is fear. Uh, needless to say, Fear is a big problem in the last days. Jesus said men's hearts will fail them from the fear and expecta uh, expectation of things coming upon the planet. Luke chapter 21, well, here's the fear of what's coming upon the planet. Let's, here it is, this graph that somebody had put together. She did a great job on it. A timeline of global risks for 2022 from a poll that was done by the World Economic Forum. And you can see at the very top, you have extreme weather in the poll. Then you have livelihood crises, climate action failure, social cohesion erosion, right? Uh, that's in the zero to two years. Then you go to the next step, two to five years. What's at the top? Climate action failure, then extreme weather, which you guys have in Minnesota. Um, <laughs> social cohesion erosion and so forth. Five to 10 years, climate action failure. Look at that, it's getting off the charts. Extreme weather, biodiversity loss. So it's, those are all tied into Mother Earth, right? But it's this fear, the fear and expectation of the things that are coming upon the planet. Okay, need to move on. I promised Mark I'd be done by midnight. Number eight, number nine, deception. Okay, this will be quick. If, you, if anybody has any questions afterwards, we can talk about it. Billy Crone has great things on this. Okay, now look at this, Dr. Stephen Greer. Anybody in here ever heard of him? So, okay, so he's just like this UFO guy. He's going to introduce you to aliens. That's his life's mission, to introduce you to aliens. CE5 contact, that's close encounter of the fifth kind. That's what that means, okay? Get it? Close encounter of the fifth kind. How many of you saw that movie? It was it Close Encounters of the Third Kind, was it? Yeah, I saw that like a long time ago. The fifth kind is like whatever he came up with. So what's close encounters of the fifth kind? Contact has begun. Look at this. What should we do? That we invite all people of goodwill on earth and amongst the stars to unite together as one people within one universe. So this is, yeah, yeah, this is an amongst the stars. Look at this. And then he has an app. You can download the app if you want. It'll cost you a little bit. I recommend you don't do it. Look at this. I'll just look at a couple of these. One in the middle, CE5, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. Um, process. Uh, in the app, you learn these things, which walks users step-by-step step through all aspects of initiating CE5 by initiating your contact with this alien. Look at this, the bottom one. Extensive library with video, images, audio samples, and meditations. What do you, what, what's the meditation about? It's, it's not about Jesus. So, you know, I look at these things and think, uh, 
I, I personally believe when it comes to deception, where Jesus said, be careful that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ. I mean, this is a guess. I'll admit that. But my guess is what's happening with all of these alien sightings, uh, this, we're going to have Antichrist system come in. The rapture is going to take place. It's an easy explanation for why all these crazy Christians were taken out of here because you were the problem. You, you weren't going along with this utopia world that was attempted to be created. And what do we have? Well, we have, I don't know, they could easily be presenting themselves as Christ, certainly the answers, which is what, uh, if you follow Stephen Greer, it's the whole thing is, look, these guys know the answers. We need to have peace. And everybody who doesn't go along with this is part of the problem. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, welcome to CE5 Ambassador Program. So if you download the app for a fee, you can be an ambassador for aliens. <laughs> we are called to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, you talk about deception. And how many people are going for this? Last thing is Israel's regathering. Um, I wish I had, next time I come back, I need five hours. And I'll just go on and on and on. I'm going to wrap it up right here. But uh, another one of the signs of the last days, of course you know this. Um, but I look at this, and it, it really helps to put it into a perspective for us for right now. Israel prepares to receive Jews fleeing Ukraine. Uh, many of you have heard that already, what's happening in Ukraine with Russia. Israel saying, hey, there could be 75,000 Jews that want to make their aliyah uh, to Israel. And when you look at it biblically, what do you have? This is what you have in a nutshell. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said to the, the scribes and the Pharisees, after he called them hypocrites and liars, you kill all the prophets, he says, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You will not see me again until you say, Hosanna. Jesus is letting the Jews know, you will call me Hosanna, and I will be back, and I will be in Jerusalem. In, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, God promised Abraham, I, here's the deal, Abraham, I'm calling you out of the land of uh, Chaldeans, I'm bringing you into your own land, and then you walk right on through the steps of Genesis 12, 13, 15, 17, and so forth, and God says, I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham, with you and your descendants forever, and it's a land covenant that he gave to the Jews. And then he said in Ezekiel chapter 36, guess what, even though you were dispersed because of your disobedience, in that day I will gather you back again because my name is on the covenant. God has been gathering the Jews back. All of the, all of the Bible prophecies, all of the signs of the second coming of Christ would have no relevance to our date right now if Israel wasn't a nation again, if Jews weren't doing their Aliyah, if we didn't have this regathering to the land of Israel again. They would be events that would be taking place. But what makes right now especially remarkable is not just that all of the signs are converging at the same time, but that they're converging at a time when God promised, I will gather you back again. And as Ezekiel chapter 38 says, in the, last, in the latter days when you're gathered back into the land, it is in that time. And so when I look at everything, I think of how this whole evening was started with a preacher up there saying, are you ready? Are you ready? Listen, uh, there are hundreds of signs of the second coming of Christ. And everything is right now is casting the shadow into a very soon coming tribulation. And when you put everything together, I look at it like this, is, there it is. Now when you see these things begin to take place, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. Amen? Lord, we thank you for this time, and I pray that you would bless the remainder of our time, uh, the panel discussion, uh, the Q&A, to you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's Pastor Tom Hughes. Let's give him a hand right now. Well, Pastor Tom, we want you to know we love you and appreciate you, and we're thankful that you're standing for truth in the midst of a difficult time. And we know you've had lots of pushback, but just know there's lots of friends out there praying for you, so be encouraged. 
Well, friends, I just want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, I mean, since this last summer, Mark Henry Ministries has reached about a million people because of your generosity. And Lord willing, going through this next year, we're going to reach three million unless Jesus comes and takes us home. And I just want to say thank you for your, your generosity, your encouragement, your, your emails. All of you are a blessing. And I, just want to, I just want to say thank you for that. Now know that Jan and I are committed to bringing events like this to you, but I'm going to ask you to help us financially to pull that off. If you're joining us online, I want to encourage you to go to our webpage, markhenryministries.com, and you go up to the right corner and click on the donate uh, page. It's safe, it's simple, it's secure, uh, but please give generously. And if you're in the room tonight, we're going to have an offering right now. I want to go ahead and ask the ushers to go ahead and come forward. And I'm going to pray for the offering. Father, again, we're just thankful for your provision. We're thankful for tonight. And God, we just pray that you would use all of these resources to advance the gospel and to encourage the hearts and lives of every single saint. God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, hey, right now, would you just take out your phone or whatever device you use for your calendar? Would you mark April 21st? Brandon Holthouse is going to be with us. Let's watch this. Now, here's the thing. Why are they so bold to say things like that? Because they know there's nothing to stop them. They have the power and they're implementing it as we speak. Now, what is the Great Reset? Obviously, there's a couple things I wanna mention. It is the World Economic Forum's name for it, the UN's name for their goal of creating the globalist system, a one world government, one world economy, one world religion. Pretty easy to understand at the base level, but that's what they're attempting. Well, how does it fit into Bible prophecy? Real simple. If you turn to Revelation 17 and 18, you will see the revived Babylonian system that plays itself out all through the tribulation. And then just to use this verse, Revelation 18:3, it says, For all the nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her, the whore of Babylon, the religious aspect of her, her fornication. The kings of the earth, that would be the politicians, the leaders, the globalists, have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth, the businessmen, big tech, big corp, have, have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So there's the key aspect. There's the three-legged uh, aspect of the Babylonian system. And so there's the, the system. The merchants of the world, they are big business. They are your Mark Zuckerbergs. They are your Amazon. They are your all these big corporations and big tech that are involved in this. Blackstone, other kinds of major corporations, international corporations. The kings, obviously, rulers, politicians, global elites, they're all involved in this. And then the religious aspect is among us today. The religious aspect can be called lawlessness or 180ism. Now, why did I say that? Because lawlessness doesn't mean anarchy. It simply means that they're going to do everything opposite of what God says. God says this is right. They say this is wrong. It's 180ism. That's the system of lawlessness. So that's why you see wokeism about everything. April 21st, mark it down right now, 7 p.m. Central Time, right here. And we're going to have a great time uh, drawing near to the Lord. At this time, let's welcome Pastor Tom Hughes and Jan Markell. Well, Jan, thank you so much for uh, working so hard to make these events take place. Now, both of you are authors, and I know people are going to ask about books and so forth. So, Jan, tell us about the products that you have and how we can access them. Okay, on the back table or in our online store, olivetreeviews.org, tons and tons of products. I'll just highlight a couple of them tonight. Uh, product that is going like gangbusters. We can hardly keep it in stock, literally. New DVD back there or in our store, Enemies Within the Church. You heard Tom uh, outline, I, one of the, I think one of the most significant articles I've read or seen, and you highlighted it. And I'll tell you, there are enemies in the church. I mean, by the boatload. So this DVD, two hours, talks all about it. It's shocking. It names names. Um, if you want to understand Revelation in 60 minutes, we have the DVD out there or online. Ed Heinsohn, fantastic. You can get an overview of the book of Revelation in an hour. That's back there. Um, another book by Ed Heinsohn. He's a dear friend of mine. 
Future glory, this is what awaits us. And, and he's got seven things that are future. And from the rapture to tribulation, doesn't wait us, by the way, uh, but seven things that await humanity, we're going to escape some of it. The second coming, we come back, and he explains all of those things beautifully in this book. And then I did bring the book I wrote a number of years ago now. Some of you have met Anita Dittman. I even met a couple up here from Harris, Minnesota, who met Anita. True story. Is there such a thing as an inspirational Holocaust story? Yes. If you've read this, you know that. How God protected and brought this woman and her mother, caused her to survive, come through the tribulation, uh, through the uh, Holocaust, tribulation, yeah, and lived to tell this story for 40 years. She told that she passed away a year ago. That book that I wrote and the DVD is back there. A ton of other products are back there. Um, I, I just want to make a quick announcement because what we're doing tonight is going to be available online. I'd like to say it'll be on our YouTube channel. That got pulled down today for three months. We will not, Olive Tree will not be on YouTube until the middle of May, uh, thanks to uh, Brandon Holthouse and Billy Crone. <laughs> they sunk me. So because of those two gentlemen who I love dearly, they're some of my best friends, they got me uh, pulled off of YouTube. So you're going to have to watch this presentation, olivetreeviews.org, markhenryministries.com, our Rumble channel, our social media will have it. So probably allow three, four, five days for editing, and you can watch it at that time. And the only other thing I want to do other than to thank Mark and his crew, they work so hard for these presentations. I was here this afternoon. You can't believe it. They're just incredible. I just want to refer to an email real quickly. This is from Tunisia. I got it right before I left. And often she says, well, I watch and listen to your programs and your blessing. You are... Um, a blessing you are to Christians like me living in beheading countries. She lives in Tunisia. And then she closes this email, not reading it, but she says last month she learned that 32% of Tunisians have left Islam. Now that is a praise the Lord, okay? Jan, thanks. Thank you for bringing us great resources. Make sure you go online, find those, and back there at the table. Tom, you've got written a number of books, and I think you've got a bunch more coming. How do they find your, your books? Uh, HopeForOurTimes.com. HopeForOurTimes.com. Well, actually, I don't even have them there right now. I don't have a store. I have books. I have no store. <laughs> I, seriously. You need a store, I, I, man. It's, it's coming. It's coming soon. Okay. okay. <laughs> at least that's what I was told the last three times. They said, soon. It's very soon. Now, Jesus is coming soon, too, so yeah. maybe he'll beat your store. So I don't know, but okay. I mean, you can get on Amazon, but I hate sending people to Amazon. I have, I have a couple of books on there. We do have DVDs. I don't think any of my DVDs are on Amazon. Is this a problem? Uh, okay, so I've got a number of videos for you, too. We're going to go through these quickly because someone went too long. <laughs> All right? He's a I preacher. Did, he I can't did, help it. I did yeah. talk to Billy. He said, go an hour and a half. Oh, Mark's yeah, going to be good with it. <laughs> and see what he did to Jan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to show you a video clip. And uh, Glenn Beck is talking. I know some folks don't like Glenn Beck. Look at me. Some people don't like you. <laughs> and it's true, right? Okay. But he talks about dehumanization in this. And I want you to listen carefully because there's a theological root to this that we are now facing in our world. You got to understand this. So let's watch clip one. Welcome back to the Rubin Report. Thank you very much, Dave. How are you? I'm just fine, my friend. You have you know? recouped from COVID. People were, you know, celebrating no, were, your demise. They I were know. very Everybody excited. Was, <laughs> I know. I was on the Levin show and he said, how you feeling? And I said, other than having COVID in my you know, uh, and uh, uh, and the country being destroyed. I'm good. <laughs> and he, he was like, wait, you have COVID? And I'm like, yeah, no big deal. Uh, it's going into my lungs now, which it always does. And I wasn't free. I kept saying, I'm not freaked out. I'm not freaked out. It's no big deal. It's no big deal. 
oh my gosh, the world was like set on fire. Glenn Beck has COVID, he should die. It was bizarre. Glenn, why is it, maybe you can explain this to me, you know a bit about my political evolution. Why is it that every time one of my friends get COVID, you, Dennis Prager, people want them to die? Why is that? You guys are good people as far as I'm concerned. Am I missing I something, because, Glenn? I think because the, um, and it's happening to the right too, we are being dehumanized. So we're not real people. And, and because of our point of view, they're already talking about, you know, uh, no medical care, we shouldn't be in society. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly what happened in the 1930s in other places. Um, it just happens to be that it's the political point of view now that's not acceptable. And what's scary is 57% um, of Democrats say, it's 48%, I think, that say you shouldn't have your children if you won't get them vaccinated. And 57 say, maybe we should put you in a camp. That's terrifying. Dehumanization is a theological movement. Do you remember that statement? Tom mentioned it, follow the science. How many of you have heard that? that just, just remember this, follow the science, there is no God. Follow the science, all of you evolved from monkeys, follow the science, the monkeys came from rocks, follow the science, the rocks came from nothing, follow the science. And once that happens, the theological implication is the Imago Dei, that, you've, that you're nothing more than an animal. So, so, so Jan, you, you wrote about uh, the Holocaust, and you've spoken on that, you've been in Israel a lot. Tell us what you, guys, what you two are seeing in regard to the dehumanization element and the implications of that. Well, it's going to blossom in the tribulation. We're seeing a run-up to it now, I think, in a terrifying manner, which we just heard about. Uh, I think we've got tribulation-like animosity going on right now. I mean, when the Antichrist steps in, people are going to be conditioned to be hateful. And we're, we're just seeing it more. And who ever thought it would be over an injection? I'll stop. Yeah, I get it. You can yeah, only say so much to. before. <laughs> it is. Yep. So, but the, and the uh, science says it's not a baby, it's a blob. Yep. You know, I mean, just follow that whole argument. But I, I have this book. I brought it with me. I was going to use it in my presentation if Mark gave me the three hours I requested, <laughs> but he didn't. But this is, it's interesting. So I, it's called How Do You Kill 11 Million People? And it's talking about the Nazis. And, you know, you have six million Jews plus others who were killed. He says, you lie to them. And then he goes right on through the different lies that the Nazis had. Mm -hmm. And they dehumanized the Jews. Yeah. They dehumanized anybody that they wanted to exterminate. Uh, and then they lied to them in the process. The, the argument with them was, it's for your safety. Get on the train. You're going to go to work. You're going to have a job. Get on the train. And, but that's what it was. It was dehumanizing them and then just going with a lie. He quotes in here, in fact, uh, this uh, from Mein Kampf, the great masses of the people will more easily fall victim to a big lie than a small one, which, you know, you've yeah. said that many times. And, and so you dehumanize and you just keep lying. And we are watching that. An entire class of the world has been dehumanized, um, especially in the Western world. We're not used to it in, in the Western world. And... China's been doing their things for a long time. Russia does their things. Muslim countries do theirs. But now the entire Western world is being shaped with this whole new system. But it is amazing, Mark, how many people look at us as less than human. Uh, uh, Macron yeah. said you shouldn't be a citizen, a French citizen. And we're hearing this type of talk. And the, the praise report is we're citizens of heaven. And, uh, and we're going home. So we have that hope but we can see what's happening and warn, warn people of this. Yeah, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, you're a citizen of heaven, a joint heir with brothers and sisters, and we're looking forward to the future. Go ahead, high five someone next to me. Tell, tell, them, tell them you're a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of heaven. It's huge. Now, once you dehumanize people, you remember what Jesus says, if you, if you hate your brother, you've murdered him in your heart? 
So when I look at somebody and say, I wish you were dead, and you can, when you dehumanize them, you can use lots of different elements to that. You're from a different tribe, you're from a different political party, you look different, you have blue eyes, you have brown eyes, uh, you like this, you don't like, you don't like this. I mean, who likes like mint chocolate chip ice cream in here? <laughs> Can you be saved? That's the question. <laughs> but once we dehumanize you, horrible things can happen. I want to show you um, this next video, and I want you two to respond. This is in the Ukraine. This is called the Hall of Demor. Most Americans have never heard of it, but, but the Marxists dehumanized the people in the Ukraine uh, centralized their land, took, it, took their land away from them, and then took the food away from them and killed 10 million of them. So 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust. 10 million are going to end up dying in the Hollow Demore. I've interviewed these people. This stuff really happened. It's happened not only once in history, but over and over and over again when you dehumanize people. Let's watch this. In the early 1930s, millions of Ukraine's people died in a devastating famine. Known as the Holodomor, it is one of the most tragic chapters in Ukrainian history. When Ukraine became a part of the Soviet Union in 1922, it was the country's breadbasket, thanks to its fertile fields of wheat. In 1928, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin introduced collectivization, which was supposed to unite privately owned farms into state collective farms called Kolkhoz. The Soviet leadership argued that collective farms would be more effective and produce a surplus, which would feed industrial workers. As many Ukrainian peasants were not willing to hand over their land to the state, their fields were confiscated. Many of them were sent into exile or abandoned their homes. In 1932, the government's quota on crops was raised significantly, and farmers were expected to harvest more than before. For many, it was a target that was impossible to meet. What grain they produced was confiscated with nothing left for them or their families. Farmers who hoarded their crops were often punished or executed. The exact number of people who died in the famine of 1932 and 1933 is still not known. Historians estimate that between three and 12 million people perished, most of them ethnic Ukrainians. Dehumanized people will kill the Jews. Dehumanized people will kill the Ukrainians. What's happening right now in Eastern Europe? But, uh, well, what's, I mean, are you talking about, well, which part are you talking about? I mean, give me. So, so, so right now, the, the Russians are stacked on so, Ukraine's border, right? So you're talking about Russia, Ukraine. Yeah. And so in 1922, Ukraine becomes part of the Soviet Union. It's the breadbasket of the world. They dehumanize them, take away their land, starve them to death. The Ukrainians are scared to death about the Russians coming back. And there's huge implications of that throughout all of Eastern Europe. And so uh, they've, got, they've got reason. Listen, Marxism, and we're experiencing this in the U.S., will always dehumanize people. It always does. Mark, yes, the problem is our education system from grade school through college glorifies Marxism. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Glorifies. Exactly. Uh, the mandate impact. Uh, all of us have experienced that. And just recently, um, Harvard, or excuse me, uh, uh, John Hopkins has come out with a, a new study. Uh, and, and this is done by legit doctors. Uh, again, I never want to suggest that we should be against science. Uh, but at the same time, you have to look at all of the evidence, right? And so I want to show you, the, you two this video clip. Tom, you have lived through a lot of mandates in California. This is this is significant as a pastor, as you've cared for folks. And so let's watch this next video clip. In this country, Johns Hopkins University, which you are very familiar with, recently came out with a study showing lockdowns didn't really work. Uh, they saved 0.02% of lives. Uh, we're talking about it here because we don't censor the news here, but you have major networks, CNN, MSNBC, along with the New York Times and the Washington Post, choosing not to run this major story. As a doctor, would you say this is nonpartisan news that people need to hear? 
Yes, look, Steve Hankey, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins and a colleague of mine, is an outstanding researcher. He's very senior, and what he did was a very sophisticated mathematical analysis of all of the existing scientific literature to really answer the question, this intervention that we did, the lockdowns for so long, was the biggest, most dramatic public health inter intervention perhaps in history. We need to evaluate it scientifically with objectivity. And that research shows that the mortality reduction was the equivalent of 1,800 lives saved from the lockdowns. Now, what, were the, what was the cost of the lockdown? 123,000 non-COVID excess deaths per year. About a quarter million people lost their lives for reasons other than COVID above the normal mortality rate. We have got to unpack that because if that, um, if that data uh, tells us what we suspect, then that tells us that this intervention had significant downsides for public health that did not outweigh the upsides. Yeah. Wow, so the, the lockdowns, saved 1,800 people, but in the calculation, 250,000 died over the last two years. Tom, you're a pastor, you pastor a large church. What have you seen the, the, the effects of the lockdowns that it's had on people? Okay, that's a great question. I'm gonna give you a couple of different perspectives. And one of them is um, with school, because our, we have a daughter that's still in high school. So we're very connected with different kids, different age groups and so forth. And with masks, going back to your other issue with dehumanization, dehumanizing people, they do. You take away the, the face, you take away all of the expressions and everything. In California, masks are a lot bigger deal than they are out here apparently, because I, I mean, you see them everywhere you go out there, even in the very conservative areas, you still see them. You know, I don't wear one when I go to a store. You get, I just get evil looks. But what's happened is with the kids, let me start here, um, and we see it every single day. The high school that our daughter is at has the gang task force there every day. I don't mean a representative campus cop. I mean the gang task force from the Riverside County Sheriff. Uh, by the way, he's the sheriff you may have seen on the national news that is pushing back against everything that Biden is doing, and he has all the left hating him like crazy. Uh, Chad Bianco. So he's got his crew out there, the gang task force, and the local police department, which you're familiar with, both there at the high school. Yeah. They're arresting people. They've got fights. They have huge drug problems. They never had this before. And they're also finding out what's happening is, uh, probably the biggest part of the problem is, for two years, our kids have been locked down. They weren't allowed to go to school in seventh grade. They weren't allowed to go to school in eighth grade. Suddenly, they come into high school wearing a mask. They did not learn how to mature. So you have all this arrested development that took place from the previous two years. So they didn't go through that maturing process. They come to ninth and 10th grade. They are the worst problem. I can talk to any high school a principal, vice principal, a leader in our area of any of the different high schools that are out there, and they will all say the same thing. It is exploding. They say it's happening all over the country uh, with these kids because it, is, it has caused such a pandemic of problems. Suicide is absolutely horrific to see what's happening there. Drug addiction, fentanyl killing kids, um, the list goes on and on. Uh, marriages that are broken. We see what's happened within the church. The church has been completely split. Some of it, I personally think there's some good things that have come out of it. Um, I, I believe God separates the wheat from the tares. But, uh, and ultimately, God is sovereign in all of this, but we have evil people who are making horrible decisions that are destroying children more than adults, and, all, and the problem is, because once you're an adult, you're, you're 25, you're 30, you're 40 years old, you're 50 years old, you're pretty much set in your ways, so you're, you're gonna be troubled. Look how troubled you are if you get on an airplane. I gotta, I gotta do this, I gotta comply, I gotta go into Minneapolis, all these things. Imagine if you're an eighth grader. You can't normalize anything, and it has brought major destruction within families, and then if the kid is raised in a family that doesn't have strong parental leadership, and, and can't see through all of the madness, guess what? Mass confusion, 
mass fear at home. That's all they hear, and it has created a huge problem. Uh, but, and it's mental issues. It's, um, uh, I was talking with Mark about this earlier. There's a very well-known doctor that uh, came to our church. He spoke on a uh, non-public uh, access video channel. Um, and uh, he talked about the mask. He's not a Christian. He talked about them based on his work with one of the Saudi families in Saudi Arabia. He would fly over there. He got to know them. And he was helping them with the problem with their, their, with their daughter with her hijab. And he said that we are seeing the same psychosis problem uh, happening here in America with kids. And he said the IQ level measurements mm -hmm. in the last two years have just plummeted. Mm -hmm. And the problem is when you have an arrested development situation, these, this is, these kids getting too normal is going to be very difficult, even if everything lifted now. But getting anything to normal ain't going to happen. But they've already set the kids back on a trajectory that I believe is intentional. Yes. Yes, that's what I was going to say. This is by design. What you've just outlined is all by design. It was intended by the globalists, the one-worlders. Yeah, I saw one article recently, and it was talking about the mask effect on, on children. And it was talking about IQ, you know, being 100 as the baseline. In America, if I remember right, I think it said that they had dropped to 78. And the, the implication of that going forward for engineers, doctors, uh, I mean, these are your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. The implication is, is massive. It was funny when you mentioned the high school. That's the high school that Jarrah and I both attended. And uh, I don't ever remember gang task force. I do remember seeing the police officer once in a while, and we all looked at each other and said, someone's in big trouble. <laughs> you know, I mean... Wait till he gets home to his father. Anyways, uh, is America facing a civil war? Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was watching the news. I don't know if it was CNN or one of them, and Ray Dalio was on there. Now, Ray is a $20 billion net worth American, and he's been leading uh, the largest hedge fund in the United States since 1985. And he's written this book, and in this book, he, he surveys history, the last 500 years, of how nations go through this cycle of becoming superpowers, and then they tail off. And it's a, it's a very interesting book. It's a, it, it's a very boring read. If you can't sleep at night, get the book. You'll go right to sleep. But if you're a historian and you understand economics, it shows this pattern, this economic pattern that, that nations go through and how they re lose reserve currency. And when that happens, it creates unrest and they go into civil war. I want you to see this video clip and listen to what he says. You write something alarming in the book. You see a 30% chance that there could be what you call a civil war here sometime in the next decade. Is that a metaphor? Is, are you talking about actual conflict? What do you mean by civil war, and, and how might that play out? What I mean by civil war is the not following the rules, the Constitution, the rules agreeing by those rules, and having a power conflict that can take its various forms. What history taught me is that when the causes that people are behind are more important to them than the system, the system is in jeopardy. And so as we go into the 2022 elections, for example, I think you're going to see the move to greater polarity in the primaries and so on, and you're going to see that intensification happen. And I think it's not surprising now that people are questioning whether rules of who is elected and whether the rules will govern. And I think that there's a good chance, and we're seeing it now, of the movements of people to, other, to different states in which, you know, certain types of people will go, the rich probably, will go to states where they're more comfortable and so on. And that creates um, questions of how even the federal government will deal with the states. I do believe there's a risk, a significant risk, that um, the rule book of how to agree uh, will not be the means by which that's decided, such as, for example, sanctuary cities or something. You send a rule down, and, they say, and a state or, or a city might say no, 
and then it will be power that will determine how that goes down. So it's that kind of civil war that I'm worried about. I'm worried about working well together to be productive. I'm worried about the extremism rather than the moderation of a one country working in a healthy way. Wow, a one in three chance of a civil war. What do you think, Tom? Um, I would listen to him. I watch Ray Dalio. And I, you know, when I asked uh, Pete Garcia, you know, Pete, you yep. had him on your program yep. not too long ago. I asked him on Monday, uh, what do you think about the possibility of a civil war? It may have been a question that somebody sent in. And he said, I do see it. Uh, and he said, but it's not going to be a civil war like it was in the past. You have North against South, you have uniforms. He said, it's going to be a lot more like what we had in places like Afghanistan and in Iraq. And he said, I, I see it. Billy Crone says uh, differently. He says, you have 70 million people in America with weapons, and it's going to be hard for a government to just easily take over or something like that. But because we do have these many people with weapons, you look at it and you go, will it turn into a physical civil war? You know, where I live, uh, I mentioned it's a very conservative area, and you have some places in California that are radically not. And I mean, you guys see them. And I, won't, I don't even want to go visit. I don't want to go visit Los Angeles. Sometimes I have to. I refuse to go there now. And I've told any friend in that area, I will not go to your county. I won't go to your city. But the, the, the people are so uh, hateful when you go to these particular areas. As soon as they think that you're not one of them, it's like, like the kid, like I gave you the example of the high school kid gets beat up, his head slammed on the concrete and taken away to the hospital because he wasn't wearing a mask. So how long will people put up with this for? I don't think a lot longer yeah. than watching what's happening in Canada. Yes. And, it's, and that is taking, it's spreading worldwide. It's I spreading. Mean, in Australia, Absolutely. it's taken off all over, even in, even in Israel. Yes, yeah, even in and Israel. And so you look at this, at the same time, will the globalist, will the Klaus Schwab group allow that to happen? Because they've pushed this car, this train way down this track, and to them just say, well, we're going we're, we're gonna to let you guys have your way. I don't see that happening. And people are livid. People are ticked. Well, I think there's two things, Mark, that could happen to complicate what we're talking about. I think number one would be if the powers that be start tampering with people's money, their savings. They start dipping in, taking it, digitizing, and then doing what they want with life savings. And I think that's on the horizon. The question is, is the church here? We don't know that. We don't know how much the church is going to go through. We don't go through the tribulation, but there's a run-up. That's what we've been talking about tonight. There's a run-up to it. And number two, if again, they continue to mess with the food supply. Mm -hmm. if, we, if they tamper with money, and if they completely wreck the food supply, then I fear, not in favor of this, I fear the guns come out. And we have, wait, right now we have a cold civil war. Then we get a hot civil war. And I, I fear that's on the horizon. Yeah, and those of us who have traveled around the world, I pray that you never experience a civil war. Your children never experience that. But it is very interesting when you look at his book and the 500 years of history. It's hard for us to even think, you know, longer than our 40 years and what we've experienced, right? Because we've always had uh, stable government, security, uh, you know, we've had it really good here in the U.S. I mean, is it perfect? No. But friends, there's a reason two million people cross the border because... This is still the best place in the world. But with, with, with this tribalism that's taking place, the division that's taking place, uh, when they start tampering with money and food, those two things uh, are going to set off an uh, unpleasant experience for all of us. Now, uh, we know there's a couple of things that happened in the last days. Deception, Tom, you talked about that. And then in 2 Peter chapter 3, it says, Know this, first of all, that in the last days mockers will come mocking. And, and I want to show you a video of a comedian. Uh, now, I just want to preface this by saying, I don't know everything about Heather. Um, from what I have seen and her, and her discussions and, and her presentations, it doesn't seem like she has a fear of God at, at all. 
Um, again, I haven't seen everything, but it seems pretty consistent. Definitely her view of morality is not a biblical view of morality. And, and she ends up uh, in her presentation uh, putting Jesus in there. And I just want to say, watch this and be careful when you, when you use Jesus joking around. Watch this. I don't mean to brag. I don't care. But I want you to know, double-vaxxed, booster, flu shot, and I'm going to be honest, I have the shingle shot too. <laughs> Traveled, went to Mexico twice, did shows, meet and greets, never got COVID. Clearly, Jesus loves me the most. Seriously. So nice. So nice. <laughs> now everyone's laughing because they think it is part of the, the show but she fell and fractured her skull Tom what do you, what do you think? I'm, Jan what do you think? Well she's symbolic of much of the world much of the western world much of America she's symbolic and uh, sh there's coming a day when these folks will real well they're going to regret They'll be too late, but they're going to regret that they're mocking, making fun of our Lord, which she's doing. There's serious, serious consequences. That was no accident that Heather McDonald just experienced, I believe. I believe that was a judgment. I see three different things there. One is, you know, we, we keep reading about the um, implications of certain medical procedures, and we're hearing about you know, you know, these things, right? It's like, I can't say anymore. Yeah. Okay, so that's one thing. The other is that I, I look at this and think that I also believe it's not a coincidence that that happened right after she says that. You know, this video is spread throughout much of the world by now. How many of you have seen it already? So, several of you. So, I mean, you look at this. All of them just saw it, Tom. Well. <laughs> and all of you online just saw it. Just, just saying, Tom. What a jerk. <laughs> Not kidding. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I was just. Jan yeah. made me do it. Yeah. I flew out here in the cold, freezing weather when Brandon gets April 21st. That's all I can say. Thanks, friend. So, uh, so just. Um, but, so you look at that and. and when she falls, to me, is remarkable. Yeah. The timing of it is just, wow. But then the reality of it is that the same thing, the thing that Jan mentioned is that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. She's still alive. So she has an opportunity to cry out and think through. I mean, if she watches her video, if she has, this is, the, when I see this, yeah. there's only one of two things that are going to happen. You come to Christ, Jesus draws you, you watch this, you start putting together the obvious things, or your heart gets harder like it did with Pharaoh. Yeah. It's like you can't, you know, you get to a place where you start making a decision on that, and, and I, it's kind of like, the, I, I see a similar dynamic that's happened within the church, and people who've gone to church in that people who used to go, or pastors, that were, that, that decided they weren't going to teach the Bible, the Old Testament, and that sort of thing. They went down this path, and now in the last two years, a lot of them made the decision, no, it's going to be about this thing that, that's all over out there, not the gospel. And their heart's grown harder. And I look at people that used to go to church that weren't saved, and they made the decision no, I'm going to go down the same path. Your heart grows harder. And, and so when I look at someone like her, just watching that on the film again and seeing it, you, you're going to come to Christ or you just, you, you've, you've settled, you've made this decision that's rejected everything that just happened, you know, what you just saw. So, you know, pray for her that we'd see her in heaven. Absolutely. Um, but there's yep. a, a lot, you know, then that's really our mission now is to give the, the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I believe that's what God is calling us to do, is preach, he's coming again, 
but you need, you need to be saved because the yeah. second coming of Christ isn't going to help you at all if you don't know Christ in the first place. Uh, can I just make a comment about, about Tom's message, the 10 points, which were excellent a summary, a summary of things that have happened in, well, you know, accelerating here in the last five, 10 years. But, but I think the key, and I made this comment at the Proximity Prophecy Conference a week or so ago, so forgive my repetition here for those who didn't hear it, but Tom and, and Mark, the speed with which these things have happened in the recent years, the 10 things, Quite frankly, we could have 20, 30, 40 things. Oh, I, I had. Yeah. But Mark said, Mark said, make your message an hour and a half like Billy Crone's. Yeah. So I got it down to 10. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, I did have a lot. <laughs> the point is, I mean, lightning fast, they've happened. Yeah. Staggering. I mean, it happened so fast. It hasn't taken decades. It's taken weeks, sometimes months for all of these things, sometimes days, for these things to play out. That's a reminder, folks. You know, time's running out. Time's running out, and you need to keep that in mind, particularly if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. Time is running out because everything is speeding up. Everything is speeding up. Jesus is coming any day. Amen. 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 Okay, so here's a question that someone sent to us. Um, how do I raise godly children given the moral assault in our society? Go, you two. Oh, okay. I raise cats. <laughs> okay. I had so, a feeling this ca question Cats was... are easier than children, probably. Okay, but... I had a feeling I'm not the best to answer to the question. So your kids are out of the home for how long now, Mark? Uh, my the last one? My, my youngest one is 30. Okay, so they've been... So my kids are still at home. Um, one of them just started working for me in the prophecy ministry, which is cool. Um, uh, and, and then there's my daughter, and, and it's a very immoral wor world. Uh, honestly, we pray for them. We, we have meals together. We do all the things that you would expect to do together as a family. That's what we do. And what's really neat is I'm here in Minnesota, and my kids want to call and talk to me, even my 20-year-old son. You know, he's a 20-year-old. 20 20-year-olds, 20 I'd never talked to my dad when I was, you know, when I was that old. I didn't want anything to do with my dad. But they were raised, um, and they're not perfect. You know, do not get me wrong. If you, if, it's, it's, right, Steve? So you see my, my, I have two kids. One of them's wonderful. And, um, and, and, and then there's my high schooler. Um, but, but still, you, you, I mean, other than, Praying and what I don't do is give devotions in King James English and all this vows and these. We're, we're a normal family with normal problems, but we really do commit to doing things together. Um, and my wife and I also will, we try to be as normal as possible and we'll take time away from our kids for a couple days too. So, but we have the Bible. They know I'm a pastor and... Um, They've learned to grow up in that environment like your kids would have had to learn to grow up in it. I, I mean, other than the word and loving your children, I can tell you this much. I think the best thing you can do is those two things, is, is love your kids and make it genuine. Uh, don't make it fake and be in the word, but I don't go preach to my kids all the time. You know, I, I, did you do that growing up saying, well, here's what the Bible says, you little sinner? I don't do that to my... I, <laughs> I don't talk like that to my kids. I don't, I don't see where the, the fruit would work from it. They hear my messages at church, um, you know, and, and I mean, what do you do? You, you, you know there's a very immoral world, and you try to get as much of Christ into their life as possible without being weird about it. Because if you're weird about it, it's going to backfire on you. Yeah, Jeff. I have a question that I'd like to... Number 11 here, um, when, we, when we see the term, all are welcome, and when we see the rainbow colors displayed on a church, outside a church, what should be our response? Um, don't walk, but run <laughs> the other direction. Now, this film...
talks about this, enemies within the church. A couple of the greatest enemies within the church, the LGBT move, whole stream of thinking, and again, fly the colored flag outside the church, and then also critical race theory, uh, the whole CR, CRT theory. These are a couple of things that are tearing the church apart. And I, mean, I, I know these pastors and they take a stand. And I know right now certain people in the electronic world are not happy with what we're saying, but uh, <laughs> we, we've got to take a stand on some of these issues. And I just say, if, if this is what you're gonna see in a church, run the other direction so fast you'll see a trail of dust behind you. Amen. Yeah, you know, amen. Here, here's the reality. We live in a fallen world. All of us are sinners. And I guarantee you, all of us in this room have had desires that are not consistent with the will of God. Every one of us. And the solution is the same for every one of us. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And you have the Holy Spirit when you become a new creature in Christ Jesus so that we are not slaves to those desires, but we can honor God and walk with him whatever those desires, whatever those desires are. God is bigger than your desires and he is worthy of our worship and our devotion and our surrender. That's why we follow Jesus. And so when somebody says, uh, follow your desires, that's demonic. That's demonic. Follow Jesus. That's what we want to say. And that leads us to another question here from one of our, one of our uh, viewers, Tom uh, and Jan. What influence does the Pope have over the direction of Christianity in China? And we could, we could say that in South America or the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. well, so in China, uh, I think this question came up because there's some agreement he entered into with the Chinese government a few years ago. Before, it was before coronavirus, and I remember it. And it basically uh, caused any genuine Christian in China to be persecuted uh, because he recognized the Chinese way of Christianity is what he did. And uh, so, and you look at this Pope all the way around, you know, you and I, you've talked well, about it a lot. Well, I think we expand the question, let's be blunt, is could, he, could his role be that of false prophets? That's, that's the yeah. bottom line issue. Yeah, that's what I was, that's, Thank you. that's exactly what I was going to throw you away. All right. Because, so, <laughs> I mean, you look at, I mean, you, I, I quoted him extensively in, in my one book, and, uh, but there's so many more things he keeps doing and saying. And... And I've said this many times, I, I, if he's not the false prophet, I'll put it this way, I do believe he's definitely auditioning for the position. And I, and I think he's, he's, he, he'd be considered. I, I have some challenges with whether or not he actually is. Right. Um, but nevertheless, the guy, he's, he's uh, blazing the trail yes. for the one who's going to be. And the other thing I think is most remarkable about this pope, what the enemy has done, and ultimately God is sovereign. Uh, just as you have the 10 kings of Revelation chapter 17 that have one mind and give their power and authority to the beast, Revelation 17 verse 17, a few verses later says, God put it in their hearts to have one mind. So the pope is going this direction. He's blazing the trail, not just for the, an, uh, the uh, false prophet to come along and antichrist also, but also look at the world's religions, mainly um, Christianity, Protestant Christianity. So many of these guys can, uh, love this pope. I mean, right. I talk to Catholics right. that do not like this pope at all That's for right. all the reasons that we don't. We, they're saying something's seriously wrong in, in the Vatican. So, but he has set this, this the, the globe into this position of this uh, false prophet of uh, having two horns like a lamb but speaking like a dragon. That would describe this pope, but ultimately that's going to be applied to the false prophet. He's going to appear to be very Christian to those who don't know their Bible, to those who have rejected the prophecies of the second coming of Christ, which is the, the majority of churches. Uh, that call themselves Christian, have rejected those prophecies as we know them. So he's blazed the trail for, uh, for the global 
religious system and people to say, yeah, that's what we should do. We should worship the, we, we should lift up the climate. We should have these climate laws. Uh, you can ignore what's happening to the Uyghurs in China. You can ignore what's happening to the, the people in Muslim countries that are being, that are being tortured and martyred for their faith, which is an article just came out about that yesterday. The Pope is complicit in the murder of these Christians in the, in the Islamic world because of his agreement with the, 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 the imam or whoever it was he met with the right, other day. Right. And so we're seeing this. But the, the worst part to me is the leaders in the pulpits in the Western world that just go along with this madness. It's evil. It, and it, it's, it's wicked. Okay, last two questions. Sorry. You two uh, read the news. Uh, <laughs> listen, these two are up at 3 o'clock in the morning when normal people are sleeping and looking at the news. They're amazing. They're texting me at like 6 o'clock in the morning. Did you see this? I'm like, no. We could text you earlier. Hers would be earlier than mine because, you yeah. know, you're two hours ahead of me, but we can do okay, it. Okay, so Mark. what? Get, I want you both to respond to this. What are the two things that you see going into uh, the remainder of this year that are going to happen that are going to impact the country? Two biggest things. Now, this is important because what happens, if you're reading the news carefully, key leaders will throw hints out about what's going to happen in the future, and they're polling people. So you've got to read with this mindset, uh, what are they baiting with so they can poll, and then that helps them make their decisions. So what are the two things that you see, Jan, two things that you see coming into the rest of this, this year? I mean, we're early in this year, but we got the rest of this year. What do you, what do you see coming? Well, the this, this most obvious thing to me, and I think it was heavily interweaved in Tom's message, is this spirit of antichrist. It's just everywhere, rebellion, uh, violence. Uh, here in Minneapolis, this is the home of the George Floyd incident of a year and a half, almost coming up on two years now. And, and that seemed to kick off some of this. I mean, we have, I've said it before, we have, those of you watching online, we have five miles of Minneapolis destroyed because of the spirit of Antichrist, this lawlessness that's getting worse and worse and worse on a daily basis. And I mean, this Antichrist spirit is it's, it's even in the church. It's just everywhere. And it's preparing the way. It's preparing the way for this man with a plan. I believe he's waiting in the wings. You know, maybe not literally in here, here in your church, Mark, but he is. <laughs> well, I hope not anyway. But... <laughs> He's waiting in the wings, ready to enter the stage of world history, and um, it's going to be, we're going to be gone. That's the good news. The church is gone. We're never, we're never, I don't even know if we, in heaven, we even know who he is. I have no idea. I think that's an intriguing question. So that, to me, is the overwhelming thing that I see on a daily basis, and I'll turn it over to yeah. you. I, I would say something very similar. In fact, I would say the same thing. Deception is going to increase. Everything's going to increase. Yeah. We know that. But there's an ebb and flow. And right now we're watching the pushback. But the globalists are not going to give up on this. Think of this. Think it's the, the Hegelian dialect where you have the thesis, the antithesis, and then the synthesis where you meet in the middle. Uh, that's what's been happening. So, uh, so we're, we're on this one side over here going, wait a minute, this stuff is bad over here. Minneapolis. Los Angeles, New York City, San Francisco. You, you see all this, right? Very chaotic, causing problems for the rest of the country, really for the rest of the world. What happened in Minneapolis has affected the entire, That's right. the entire globe. So you have this problem here, which is all-encompassing uh, from LGBTQ things to CRT, uh, right on down the list, uh, transgenderism stuff that's off the charts. And you have us. And the devil is behind the details. Mm -hmm. So the devil's goal is to get you to the synthesis, to, to meet in the middle. What he's managed to do is pretty much get the most of the world for all the way over to here. Real, very simple in the last two years. He's gotten us all the way over here. And many people have gone all the way. Um, it's, it's like a car salesman, right? The car salesman, or the car says, here's your, your sticker price, and you say, you hear the word sticker shock. 
<laughs> You're kidding me. Well, the car dealer doesn't really want that much money. He just wants you to come from here because you're lowballing him. He just wants you to meet him in the middle. Some people are foolish enough to pay the whole price. He just wants you in the middle. That's all he's doing. And we're watching this play out. We're being, we've been pulled along, and we're going to get pulled along further because the further this goes with lawlessness and, and these other things, the more freedoms the majority of people are going to be willing to surrender right. and say whatever it takes. To the point that after the rapture, when Antichrist appears on the scene, he's going to have the answers. He's going to say, I'll be able to give you, look, these guys messed up. I think, personally, Jan, I think these globalists are being used right now by enemy, by, by Satan. I think they're useful idiots. Yes. He's playing them, and he's going to be able to discard them once his man comes on the scene. His man's going to come on the scene That's and say, right. these guys messed up everything. You don't need to take anything, boop, boop, in you, just on you. I'll fix the whole problem. And in the meantime, the entire system has been set up. The whole beast system has been set up by these people, the religious system, the money system, the political system, and everything. But it's uh, lawlessness will abound, is what Jesus said. Okay, last question. You guys see all this stuff, and, you, and you're constantly focused on it. What verse or truth keeps you from going insane? Because all of us are feeling like we're going insane. How is it that God keeps you from total depression, jumping off a bridge, uh, standing in front of a Mack truck? <laughs> I, I, I'd like to hear Jan's answer. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I could give you mine. You want me to go first? I'll you, go first. Well, you which, go, which, what you, do you prefer? Ladies first. I don't want to put you on the spot. I don't want to do what Mark's doing right now. I know. Ladies first. <laughs> Well, there are so many, Mark. There are, there, there are so many. I mean, God has, obviously, he's got everything under control. I think, I think the verse that intrigues me is, and I think I just used it in my radio programming that's coming up here pretty quickly, and that is Psalm 2, because we have considered some very weird things tonight and some weird people and things going haywire, and in almost every case, it's led by evil men. Do you know what Psalm 2 says about it? God says, he's sitting in the heavens laughing at these people, laughing at these people. Yeah. Keep that in mind. He's got it under control. He thinks these people are fools. He's laughing at them. He's got the last word. And he's coming again any minute. Amen. Yeah, Amen. There you go. Amen. 2 Peter 1, verse 19, reminds us that the prophetic word shines light in the darkness. And I started teaching Bible prophecy probably because I was stressed out 30 years ago. <laughs> Seriously, I, I needed answers to, you know, to just help me understand everything. And um, the prophetic word is what keeps me. Although I have to consume the news every day, I go home, I don't want anything to do with it. <laughs> My wife does. She wants to talk to me all about it. I'm done with it. But, <laughs> but it's the prophetic word because I know how it ends. And I know these are signs that point to Jesus coming. I teach on two topics more than anything else. Although I go through the Bible, like I'm in the book of Ruth right now on Sunday mornings, I go through the Bible. I love teaching on Bible prophecy and I love teaching on heaven because those two subjects keep me heavenly minded and because i can keep my it, they help me to keep my mind fixed on things above so as bad as stuff gets and even when i want to get stressed out and i get really angry and the youtube stuff and all these yeah. other things it's still um i know that i'm much better off far better off than anybody else that is not in the prophetic word and doesn't do a study on heaven, the real heaven, not the guy who died and went to heaven and has all these things to tell you about <laughs> chocolate or something. The, I mean, the real heaven, the, what the Bible tells us, Revelation 21 and 22. And, and those are very encouraging. And, and we don't have to fear. Jesus said this in Luke 21, when you see these things begin to take place, look up and lift up your head because your redemption draws near. That phrase, lift up your head, means with joy. That's what you're saying, with joy. So with that, oh yeah, this is what 
that's what this stuff reminds me of. You told me it was going to be like this. That's right. And, it's, I, and we have to remind ourselves of it. And that's probably why you come to places like this. And probably why you watch the videos you do, because you realize it sustains you, it strengthens you, it encourages you. And everybody else thinks you're nuts, but that's all right. Our citizenship is in heaven, and Peter wrote something about us being a peculiar people, so that's okay. Access his prophecy updates. They're outstanding. A couple of times a week, at least, you're posting them. Excellent, yeah. excellent. Don't miss them. We'll give these two a hand. Now, tonight, there's two things I want to close with. We have a gift for all of you that are here because you braved the weather, okay? Uh, I've just, I've written a book. It's called The Man Code. One of the things people ask is how do we navigate this? One of the things is just simply follow Jesus. In the midst of the fog, hold the hand of Jesus and walk with him. The Man Code, we've got uh, that gift for you tonight. We want one for every family. If you were here Sunday and you already got one, don't take another one. Okay. Uh, if you're online watching right now, I want to encourage you to go to Amazon. You can get it there. But there's 12 things that I discovered in the Bible. My dad died when I was five. And, and I just, when I trusted Jesus, I started reading through the Bible. What does a good man look like? How do I be a man of God? I mean, that's really the bottom line. Whatever else happens in the world, I don't have control over. How do I be a man of God? There's 12 of them. Ladies, you want to have a man of God in your home. You want to raise men of God. Uh, you ladies who are single and you're looking for a man, trust me, you want to marry a man of God. And actually these 12 things started being, I started writing them down with my daughter uh, on, on Saturday mornings when we go to cinnamon roll. I said, Missy, these are the things you want to be looking for. And so uh, we think that'll be a great help to you. The second thing is that verse that's right up there. Um, I think, you can, I think you can follow along there as I read it, but Psalm 31, 24, it says, Be strong, and it says, Let your heart take courage, all of you who hope in the Lord. Now, that's a commandment, all right? God didn't say you be afraid. He didn't say you be paranoid about all the things that are happening. Oh, my, the economy's being destroyed. That's true, but you've got to be strong. You've got to strengthen your heart. In fact, those two Hebrew words are used many times in the Bible, and they're used together. The first Hebrew word, they're strong, has the idea of being rooted, not easily pulled out, uh, to have strength. And then it, the next phrase, it says, strengthen your heart. So the, 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 the idea there, that second Hebrew word is, even make it stronger than what it was. And notice specifically it has to do with the heart, the in, immaterial part of you. Uh, you, know, you recognize that there's a, a physical part of you. That's why you're sitting here, right? And then there's an immaterial part of you. And throughout the Old Testament, it's a re reference of the heart. The way the man thinks in his heart, so is he. And on and on it goes. And so it has to do with the, the mental part. It has to do with the emotional part. And friends, I want you to see this. It's your responsibility to strengthen that. I can't do it for you. You can't do it for me. And it's used everywhere in the Old Testament, everywhere in the New Testament. For example, when Paul was about to die and Timothy was going, how could we lose the apostle Paul? 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1 says, be strong, Timothy, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You might remember in Ephesians, it talks about being strong in the Lord, put on the full what? Armor, Armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day, Right? And so this concept of strengthening is used over and over, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Christian friends, be strong in the Lord. Turn to someone, tell them, be strong in the Lord. <laughs> now I want you to notice this last phrase. It says, all of you who hope in the Lord. If you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're ready for Jesus to come, you've trusted him then you are in a relationship with the living God who's created the heavens and the earth. The God who, uh, the world may say, where is your God? We know from Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. And so our confidence is in him. But maybe you're here or you're listening right now on this stream and you haven't trusted Christ. I want to encourage you right now to get ready for Jesus' coming. Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. He rose again the third day. He is the Son of God. The Bible says in Acts 
4.12, that there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. 150 times in the New Testament, it says when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, when you put all of your trust in him, not in church, not in your good works, not in baptism, not singing in the choir, uh, not giving money, but when you trust in Jesus alone to pay for your sins, he gives you the gift, the gift of eternal life. And if you haven't put your faith in Christ, tonight's the night. Don't push God off. Don't say another day. Today is the day of salvation. And so I just want to invite you. I'm going to lead in prayer. I want to invite you. If you haven't trusted in Christ, you need to trust in him because the world is filled with fear. But when you trust and hope in the living God, you can have strength. You can strengthen your heart. And you can walk by faith in the midst of these days. Trust in Jesus Christ tonight. Would you pray with me? Father, we're thankful that you're the God of heaven and earth. And God, we look to you and bless you as the God who created all things, sustains all things, and the God who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. And God, I just pray that you would strengthen all of my brothers and sisters in this room and those that are watching online. And, and Father, I just pray for the salvation of every one of my friends. Whether it's the people we've talked about tonight, the people that we've quoted tonight, we desire for them to all know Jesus. And I pray for all of my friends that can hear my voice right now that they would trust in Jesus alone. My friend, if you feel the Spirit of God tugging at you, pulling at you, if you're not sure that you're going to heaven, right now you call upon the name of the Lord. You say, Jesus, I need you to save me. I need you to save me from my sins. My sins have separated me from the living God I confess that, and I repent of that. I change my mind, metanoia, and I look to the cross. Jesus, you died on that cross for me. Can you say that in your heart tonight? Jesus, you died on that cross for me. And right now, tell the Lord this. Lord, I trust in you the best I know how as my Savior to pay for my sins and to wash away my sins. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. God, hear our prayer. Help us to draw near to you in these last days. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.